as, as we look towards the Department of Defense, I mean, you know, one of the big things that I want to outline before we even dive in, which is well, the private sector, when they're working with data, that's really their IP. That's their gold, if you will. They look at it as very valuable. That's why bulk data collection has become almost commonplace um, and becoming a regulation nightmare at the same time because there's so much value in data. Whereas the DOD, uh, specifically the airport that we were talking to, they look at it in the, in the form of threat vectors. And uh, when you start shifting your thinking, and a lot of the private sector is all built on nice to haves. You, even interoperability of the automotive sector, um, we're still not at that need level. We know that we want that technology and we want what it can offer. But when you talk about threat vectors, you actually start to introduce a needs, a must have. So we're gonna talk a little bit about multi-domain command and control uh, within the Air Force, Army and Navy. The multi-domain operations concept is the foundation of our modernization effort. The concept details how the Army, as part of the Joint Force, converges capabilities across multiple domains, land, air, maritime, space, and cyberspace in order to defeat an adversary's efforts to create standoff. Army forces, as an element of the Joint Force, conduct multi-domain operations to prevail in competition below the level of armed conflict and, if necessary, win in armed conflict. Specifically, during conflict, Army forces penetrate and disintegrate enemy anti-access and area denial systems, creating freedom of maneuver. Starting off with multi-domain command and control being a big umbrella and then for us to kind of go down all the way to the sensors that may be woven into a, you know, a soldier's fabric of his clothing or her clothing. Um, how important even that one sensor and you kind of scale it out, you start to see how, yes, okay, they're creating 2,000 terabytes of data every 60 seconds within the Air Force uh, alone. I mean, this becomes a big problem. Um, and that's why, yes, um, we're early. And I, I can't state that enough. I, I think that the community has been really excited about the adoption of, of Constellation within the Air Force and other outfits. And it's gonna continue, we're gonna continue to permeate those but know that we're, we're working to stitch a big vision. We're not just going after quick contracts to prove out that, hey, we've got customers, but rather we wanna solve big issues that compound over time. And you look over going back to kind of our data pipeline, as well as the original multi-domain command and control slide of the threat vectors, you have those big data collectors and producers like the Army, the Navy, and uh, the Air Force there off to the left. And then you have all these different domains, these institutions, you know, the, the uh, NSA, you know, NASA, doesn't matter if it's the Air Force. They all need to be not only able to communicate with each other, but also be able to ingest direct data from those creators as well. Uh, because those centralized systems, going back to what we were talking to a few slides back, they, they're just not going to cut it. There has to be a way to be able to pivot much quicker and creating a secure and agile interoperability environment. So that as it goes downstream, those big data consumers, whether it's applications, you know, business intelligent tools um, and so forth, but the, the two biggest important ones, I think really are artificial intelligence uh, systems as well as mission control systems. That's where the magic really happens. So. Um, this kind of zooms it back out and talks a little bit about why this bigger picture from my multi-domain command and control really matters. Our whole thing is that there's an evolution of cryptographically securing complex data structures right. across a decentralized network. What we have done is that we have created a framework for formal verification in such a way that we are able to verify the state of a distributed system using only types. Like, let that sink in. We have rewritten how formal verification works for decentralized applications. Show the most simple data type possible, which has the result of verifying a ledger balance. But in essence, it is actually a data type that we are showing as an MVP. What we're trying to do with the federal government is that Constellation aims to be standard amongst these agencies in which they securely communicate data. So uh, while that is a very kind of broad statement, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, we sat down with uh, you know some really great contacts at uh, Jake, so that's J-A-I-C, which stands for Joint AI 
um, or Joint Artificial Intelligence Center. Uh, you know, that's really kind of the hub that's focusing on accelerating uh, the findings of, of uh, and possibilities of artificial intelligence within the federal government. Um, so naturally, when you think about the need of these algorithms that are being used in artificial intelligence, for, in order for that data to be secured and validated prior to its make, making its way into those systems uh, to be used for automation, we play a huge role in that. Um, and we even discovered that there's more than just you know, securing the data stream, but also securing the entire AI algorithm. So um, there's layers to this that I think were very um, complementary to what our solution brings to the table. Um, we met with folks at the Department of Homeland Security, uh, much like if you've seen that Doug video, a lot of his constituents uh, we connected with. General Dynamics IT. Um, there's a big group, has a huge presence in uh, DC. You can look them up and see what they're involved in. Um, they were very interested in our technology and saw uh, multiple entry points for us to work together. We are GDIT, the thinkers, innovators, and mission experts, supporting some of the most complex government, defense, and intelligence projects across the country, delivering the solutions that ensure today is secure and tomorrow is smarter. We are there, working on the ground, behind the screens, and everywhere in between. Making the connections the world depends on, providing systems that enable the intelligence community to find insights that matter. We deliver what supply demands, transporting 8.2 million assets to government posts worldwide. We translate the language of the cloud into the language of the mission and provide high-impact cyber solutions that secure critical systems on a global scale. We better our world through artificial intelligence, improving flight safety for over 848 national airports and detecting and preventing $113 billion of fraud. We advance medical research by analyzing 360 billion rows of data, and we respond at critical moments in time operating the high-performance computing technology that enables the prediction of weather and climate patterns. We perform at the speed of change, co-creating with more than 90 tech partners to move the mission forward with the people, technologies, and innovations that matter. GDIT, delivering the art of the possible. Um, one that was really fun, I think, uh, you know, Mr. Jorgensen was uh, particularly keen on this group is InQtel. A lot of folks don't know what InQtel is, but they're, uh, for lack of a better understanding, they're the uh, investment arm for the, the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. We also met with a lot of folks from the U Uni uh, United States Air Force, uh, a lot of great contacts that, uh, frankly, one of them was a one-star general. So we have plenty of, of follow-ups to do with that group uh, and they are actually going to be playing a role in some of the efforts that I'm going to disclose here in a moment. Um, we also met with the U.S. General Services at, uh, Administration, which is also known as the GSA. Um, the, these are folks that really are the layer that uh, um, help better allow you know uh, Americans to perceive the services that are being generated by the government. So it's the bridge between um, what's happening with the government and the civilian layer. Um, we see a big opportunity there. Another name was like Booz Allen. Booz Allen is a major um, uh, government prime and uh, they saw many entry points and we have some follow-up meetings with them as well. It takes a network to defend a network. Booz Allen Hamilton's Cyber Solutions Network capabilities combat threats with a global collection of dynamic defense centers and leading edge solutions. The network is scalable with surge capacity to virtually connect expert cyber analysts, research and testing labs, malware reverse engineers. It breaks down the weapons of our enemies to see how they work, where they came from, what they're after. This network takes a holistic approach, blending people, 
technology, policy, operations, and management to make a truly integrated response. Booz Allen Hamilton Cyber Solutions Network protects everything you've worked to build. You know, when we're talking about stuff that is embedded at the, the infrastructure level, those standards, um, that's a really sticky, scalable solution, especially when you have multiple constituents that have all agreed that this is what we're going what, what to use in order to communicate this data. With that, we have other stakeholders that I'd love to talk about. One is called the Air Force um, Agency for Model and Simulations. Um, another one is called Synthetic Training Environment out of the Army. Um, and then I would say tertiary to that, which is one we just started uh, digging into, is NAVSUP which is with the Navy, really focused on um, a lot of that kind of maintenance data, supply chain management data, um, and so forth. Uh, but what's cool about, just to kind of give you a use case to make sense why this is important to, say, the synthetic training environment or the model and simulations group that do training, not only for just training purposes, but also to translate that data into war fighting capabilities for real world. It's the synthetic training environment, or STE. The STE will provide immersive and intuitive capabilities that keep pace with a changing operational environment, giving commanders the ability to overcome today's limitations and take on the challenges of tomorrow. Advancements in virtual reality, big data analysis, artificial intelligence, and terrain representation will make this possible. These time and resource limitations, as well as environmental and geographic constraints, have led to the DoD effort known as One World Terrain. The STE will use One World Terrain to provide the training audience simulated battle spaces of any place on the globe. One World Terrain prototypes are already pushing the boundaries of terrain representation to provide warfighters realistic training in complex environments like megacities or dense urban terrains, which are a growing operational concern. And furthermore, there's certain like licenses and software and all this stuff that make up this simulation that uh, in order to deploy, there's a lot of procurement in involved to getting these licenses for those that are going to pay for this experience. Um, and they were really excited about the idea. This was their idea, which is uh, another tip of the hat to why the government is really understanding distributed ledger is what if we could just do micro payments for those that utilize those different software licenses in the moment versus it having to be something that's like procured and bundled. We have the infrastructure in place for machine communication already. I know that I'm covering a lot here. Um, this, again, is, this stuff is not for the faint of heart, but we're in a really great spot and we're in the trenches right now and we're not in the clear. That's why these relationships with these one-star generals really matter because we want to get the right blend of constituents across different agencies to say, yes, this is what we're doubling down on. And we now have those names of those stakeholders. It's now just a matter of executing.